Welcome to Second Half Now, a radio show for boomers and beyonders. Tools and tips for the life you want to live from now on with Dr. Dan Critchett and Dr. Denise Hogan. Second Half Now, sponsored by Dignity Memorial. It's time for Second Half Now. The doctors are in. Here are your hosts, Dr. Dan and Dr. Denise. And welcome to the second part of Second Half Now. I usually say the second half of Second Half Now, but then I even get myself confused. So we are now calling it Part 2. The title for this show is Taking Care of Tomorrow's Priorities Today. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Critchett, along with our co-host, Dr. Denise Lopez-Hogan. This portion is coming to you on a podcast, as you know, because you're listening to it on a device of some kind, on a phone or a tablet or a laptop or a desktop or something. And uh, this part of the show, this part two, is only available here online. The uh, radio portion is on air Mondays at KKPZ, 5.30 to 6 p.m. More about that as we get further along here. So uh, we're very pleased to have uh, in studio our guest, John Boylston, estate planning attorney with a local law firm, Myatt and Bell. Welcome again, John. We're glad to have you here with us today to discuss the topic, taking care of tomorrow's priorities today. Thanks, Dr. Dan. Well, let's get back into our conversation. And Denise, uh, can you help us get back on track? Uh, we have covered so much so far. And I just want to say, if a person is listening to this part and hasn't heard the other part, it's available there um, as a podcast. So you want to hear that. A lot of really good stuff sets the stage for this Part two. So where do we get back into it? It absolutely does, Dan. Uh, John, you provided a great overview of why estate planning is so important. So I I encourage our listeners to go get that information. But where we want to start with is uh, timing. When is a good time for us to start putting an estate plan together? That's a great question, Dr. Neese. Thank you so much. The I like to tell my clients that the time to start planning, the best time to start is when you get married. You know, start right at the beginning. Most people wait until they're in their 50s. But if you really think about it, it's important to start that day you know, when you get married. Because now, for the first time when I got married, I had both my wife and my parents, two different groups that both have a really intense interest in my life and my well-being. And it's important for them to see eye to eye on decisions that would need to be made for me if I were incapacitated. But it's more important for me to say who I want to make those decisions for me. If I don't do planning, if I haven't appointed somebody to be my health care agent and something happens to me, then it's left for the doctor and the courts to determine who do they listen mm. to. Do they listen to my parents or my wife? Uh, this was the Terry Schiavo case in Florida a number of years ago where a woman ended up on, assist- on uh, tube feeding and life support for almost eight years while the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court because her husband and her parents couldn't agree on what kind of care she should get. So I encourage any parent who or any adult as soon as they get married – Get an estate plan so you at least have it clear who you want to speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. And then the next step is any parent. And as soon as you have a child, if you've got a minor or you're the guardian for any minors, you have to have a will. A will is the only legal document where you can name guardians for your child or your minor should something happen to you. So every parent has to have a will. And that's just a minimum. And that's the place where everybody needs to start. Such important points, John. And you know that case you bring up, that wasn't just a kid. A catastrophe for that family that was something that the nation stood by and watched and it was so painful so I really appreciate your emphasis on that today that it is highly important for the members of a person's family to agree on what should happen if we can't make those decisions for ourselves um, you know there are there are a lot of stresses associated with estate planning that one in particular is is huge where you have a spouse and family members that don't agree. Um, you know, but I imagine there's other things too that make it difficult for people to get started in this process. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. I think there's a few big hurdles that most people face with estate planning. And the first is that they, unless someone has gone through a divorce, it's likely that they've never had to work with an attorney before. Most of us in our day-to-day lives don't have an attorney on call or somebody that we have to work with uh, in the legal industry. So for many people, there's an anxiety 
just associated with having to go in to speak to an attorney and they don't know how much it's going to cost or how long the process is going to take or how complicated it's going to be. And so to overcome those hurdles, that's why we offer the complimentary consultation for estate planning so clients can just come in and get a chance to meet me and meet the other attorneys in our firm so that they know us and they know whether or not they want to work with us. If they don't have confidence in us and attorneys as attorneys, if they don't trust us, then it doesn't matter what work we do or how great it is for them because they'll never have confidence in the work that we do. So to kind of overcome those initial hurdles and anxieties from clients, we like to make it as easy as possible. We also, as to how complicated it is, most clients were able to get their estate plan done within a month to six weeks from first meeting to the signing of the estate plan. So it's really not that complicated, but people don't know that until they come in and get a chance to speak to us. Right. It's a mysterious world for most of us, Dan. Dan, wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. And timing is important. And and I know this might be unnecessary to clarify or to say, but I think for the sake of our listeners, it it might be health healthy and helpful. That is, let's say that someone is 45 or 50 or 55, they'll say, well, gosh, you know, I don't know what I want to have now, and my circumstances will probably change. So I'm assuming that there is some sort of way that if, if a younger person or, you know, you know, someone who's still maybe in their working and, and earning years, they could still put a basic plan in place and then could modify that as their circumstances change. Absolutely. Great clarification, Dr. Dan. All of the basic estate planning tools, a will, a living trust, an advanced directive, a power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, all of those tools are revocable and changeable whenever you want. So nothing is set in stone and can't mm-hmm. be changed. So any client that comes in and they make this plan today, they can change it tomorrow if they change their mind. And what we often see is clients who do their plan when they're in their 50s or 60s tend to have enough of an idea of what they want and we're able to help them through that process so they put in place a plan that they never change. Mm-hmm. But for clients that come in in their 30s and 40s when they've got young children, a big portion of their plan is often how are they going to take care of those kids. Now when they come in 20 years later, the kids are adults and are taking care of themselves so they're able to revise that plan and account for the new situation that they're in. Right. And with your uh, fee approach... The flat fee approach, it's not like, you know, uh, being worried about giving you a call and having a marker every every six minutes as uh, one-tenth of the hourly rate, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So with the when we're doing the planning, they can call clients can call me as much as they want. We can have as many meetings as a client mm-hmm. needs to make sure that they get the plan that they want and that it's exactly what they want and they're comfortable mm-hmm. with it. I also, that allows them time to ask questions, so just understand it. You know, I don't want clients to not ask a question because they're afraid of having to pay for the answer. Right, Mm -hmm. right. So you'll know this when you get to be closer to uh, the age that Denise and I are now. But um, we have different ways of um, of having motivation for decision making, and I was telling about uh, telling you about that during the break. And that is that uh, we are enticed to positive things. We say, yeah, that's important, that's valuable. But the real drive uh, oftentimes for us is what happens if we don't do that, if we don't make that decision, if we don't put that thing in place and then we say, oh, my gosh, you know, I don't want I don't want that to happen. So sometimes it's a negative motivation, but it's still very valuable and very healthy. So could you help us understand some of the basic um, estate planning components and what will happen if we don't do those things. The, just pick a few and help us understand what will happen if we don't do some of those basic fundamental estate planning things. Absolutely. So as an initial matter, if an individual doesn't do any planning and they pass away, they pass away with an estate plan that we like to call as the state of Oregon estate plan. Right. It's mm-hmm. been written by the state legislature. We've got laws that dictate exactly where your assets are going to go, who's going to get what, and who's going to make decisions for you. Because the state legislator wrote it, of course, you're going to pay the absolute maximum in taxes. Mm, There is no tax planning in the states plan for you. Uh, Additionally, if somebody needed to make health care or financial decisions for you, they would have to go and get a guardianship or conservatorship for you. This is an intense legal process. Essentially, they are suing you and asking the judge to declare you incapacitated and asking the judge to appoint them as your guardian. So each step, anytime you have to involve the court, the Mm. cost of doing it goes up dramatically. Because you have to pay for filing fees, you pay for the court's time, you pay for the judge's time, and you have to pay for an attorney to show up in court for you. So and with no plan, you end up having to go to court a lot more, and everything, how your assets are distributed, becomes much more complex. It takes longer for your family, and it just becomes a mess. And I'm guessing that in most cases, the state will make different decisions than I would have if I was making them. Absolutely. For yeah. instance, if you, if I were to pass away without children, 
and my wife and I'm a single individual, my assets would go to my parents, not my siblings. And most individuals that I talk to without kids, they think they'd rather leave their assets to their brother or sister than their parents. Mm -hmm. But the state plan says it goes to your parents. So that's where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. And, and again, talking about the way our bodies feel stressors, <laughs> that's, I'm feeling anxious about that. I can feel that loss of control and power being taken away through the process of just letting whatever happens mm -hmm. happens what will happen is not is is not positive yeah absolutely and so that's if you've done nothing you end up with that kind of worst case scenario if you have an estate plan that includes a will that's the next level up you know i would include all the health care planning documents the incapacity planning documents in there and if you have those in a will then you at least have control over where all of your assets are going to go but to get there your family's going to have to go through probate and have to incur the costs and all the time associated with probate, and the individuals where you're leaving to whom you're leaving your money, and the charities and nonprofits that you care about that you're leaving money to, they're not going to get those assets until at least some period of time has lapsed because mm -hmm. probate takes at a minimum six months and often more, closer to nine months or a year depending on how it's going. A concern that I have is that when people in my congregation, when I'm serving as a pastor. They mean well, you know, they're regular givers or tithers or contributors, and they, they want to provide something for their church. I mean, in addition to other missions and ministries and so forth, but they miss that opportunity if they don't put it in place. Absolutely. If, there's no, if you don't have it in writing that your assets are going to go to a nonprofit or your church and other organization you really care about, then it's all going to go to your family. There is nothing in the default state of Oregon plan that would allow your assets to flow to anyone other than your blood relatives. And I suppose you could leave instructions with your relatives, but you're asking them to give away money that they've inherited from you. So yeah. they, they may or may not be too interested in doing that. Huh? Exactly. If you just leave written instructions to your relative and use that as an estate plan, they have no legal obligation whatsoever to right. follow your instructions. Right. I think of some of the things that could be done, for instance, with an estate plan that includes your church. So as an example, even if you were to leave a percentage or a fixed dollar amount, what would happen if, let's just say, that part of my life insurance you know, goes to my church and I want to earmark it for a staff position? So what if I can fund a youth worker or fund a, another ministry development you know, for $50,000 for a whole year or whatever it would take? Uh, then my, uh, my impact in that church and in that community lives on. So th this is the way, it seems to me, that estate planning is a way for the good that I wanted to do, and maybe I didn't uh, outlive my, my good intentions, uh, but I can leave some of that behind and help create uh, an impact long after I'm gone. That's a great idea, Dr. Dan, and I regularly talk to clients about this. A lot of my clients will tithe as part of their estate plan. They'll leave 10% to their church, mm -hmm. just as they did during life they want to do at death as well. Right. Uh, and for others, they want to put limitations or earmarks on how and where the money is used. And my position is that anything that anyone receives from your estate is a gift. They're blessed to receive right. it. It was your money that you worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. You earned it, and you get to leave it however and to whomever you mm -hmm. want. And that includes putting it on limitations on it so that it funds a specific position at the church, for instance. It's really whatever you're passionate about. You can leave your legacy and your stamp on things by putting in instru instructions on exactly how you want your money to be used. And mm -hmm. we regularly help clients determine that. And we sometimes we help clients figure out if the instruction they want to put on it would be too burdensome to the organization. You know, sometimes people mm -hmm. want to go a little too far. And we'll help them determine whether or not it makes sense, whatever sort of limitation okay. they want to put on the money. Yeah. You know, John, think about what you said about putting limitations on the way the, your money is used once you have passed away. And I'm thinking about our kids. And sometimes our best intentions can lead to harm. Can you talk more about those limitations as it applies yeah, to inheritance? Yes. Yeah, money has the ability to both help and hurt when we leave it to another individual. And every parent's wish is that the money they leave their children will help them, and it won't harm them. So when I talk to parents, I talk a lot about how are their kids doing? You know, I mean, first we start the biolog biographical stuff, how old are they and that sort of thing, but really, how are they with managing money? Are they struggling with drugs or alcohol? 
Uh, do they have any particular passions or things that the kid really wants to do in their life? And then I help the parents put limitations or leave the money in such a way that it will only help the child. So, mm -hmm. for instance, that child struggling from drug or alcohol, we put money in a trust with a trustee that gets to determine how and when the child will get the money in ways that will help them. Maybe the trustee pays the bills directly for the child, so the money never passes through the child's hand and they never have the ability to use it on drugs or alcohol, but at the same time their rent is paid for and their groceries are paid for and their medical costs are paid for, so they're still being helped. Uh, other kids might not be great savers, and I've had done this with a number of clients where the parent knew that their kid, no matter what, was never going to have a retirement plan. It was never going to save a dollar. So instead of leaving the child the money outright, whenever they pass away at age 30 or 40, when the child's 30 or 40, the parent said, I'm going to put the money in a trust until the child's 65, and what this will be their retirement account. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a number of different ways we can help uh, children. We've even had one client who really wanted their kids to be entrepreneurs. And so he said, when my child... Uh, you know, after I pass away, if my child submits a business plan to the trustee and the trustee says, yeah, that's a good business plan, then the trustee is entitled to give the child $50,000 to start his business. So there are even ways mm. here where you can incentivize the children to take on your passions and your beliefs and carry them forward. Wow. You know, what I see in that, too, is we were talking about the power of a legacy. In that sense, it's not just the money that lives on, but your parental influence, guidance, encouragement lives on. That's just a fascinating idea to be listening to today. Absolutely. Their parents pour so much into their kids' lives, and it doesn't have to stop when they pass away. They can continue to pour into them long after. That's right. What I like about the whole concept of estate planning is that my good intentions are not going to be followed. Uh, very likely after I die, because a lot of times people, no one would know what they were. Mm. But with estate planning, when I put it down in legal documents, I make sure that my good intentions will be followed through with, right? Absolutely. Uh, a will is a valid legal document that goes to court and gets a, it's a recommendation to the judge, and the judge stamps it at the end of the day and says, yes, I honor these wishes, and mm -hmm. your assets will be distributed that way. A living trust is a legally binding contract between you and your beneficiaries so that you put the limitations on the money and they, if they accept the money, accept the limitations as well okay. and all of your good yeah. intentions. Mm -hmm. So, and I also know that you deal with um, power of attorney. Uh, that's part of it. At, w w at what age sh should a person, a healthy person even, uh, even in our age group, uh, be thinking about power of attorney? I think a power of attorney is a fundamental tool of every estate plan. Uh, an estate plan is really a toolbox. We don't know what scenario you're going to encounter in life, and so you want to have all the tools available there You should you ever need them. And a power of attorney is one of those tools, so it should be in every estate plan. But I actually encourage people to get a power of attorney even when they go to college. I've started putting together a few of these estate planning documents mm -hmm. as a package for parents to get for their college-age students because when a co college-age student turns 18, they go off to college. Well, the parent no longer has a right to the child's medical records if something That's happens right. to the kid when they're in college. Yeah. They don't right. have a right to the co child's grades. If the child becomes incapacitated or is injured at college, the parent has no way to make financial decisions or medical decisions for the child. So uh, that's another time where I think it's important to start thinking mm. about these things and yet let the child authorize their parents to make these decisions for them and get their information when it's needed. That's ringing a bell because I remember when my daughter was in high school, I couldn't even I couldn't even find out what library book she was checking out. <laughs> and she was under 18, I think, at the time. I, I don't know. I got lost on that. But more about power of attorney and what happens if we don't put some of these things in place in our total estate planning package right after the break. Don't go away. Helping to plan a funeral for someone you love is a painful process. It's one of the most emotional things you'll ever have to do. But imagine how much grief would be spared if people plan for themselves. Though it may sound difficult or uncomfortable to even think about, the experts at Dignity Memorial Funeral Homes and Cemeteries can help with a free personal planning guide that takes you step by step through the process. And of course, Dignity Memorial will even help you complete your plan with the expert assistance of trained and caring advisors. There are a lot of very good reasons to plan ahead. Make sure your final wishes are respected, sparing your loved ones the added grief of planning for you and having to pay for it. If you choose to fund your plan early, you can even lock in current pricing, avoiding increases due to inflation, and take advantage of budget-friendly payments. There is a free informational seminar that includes a complimentary meal at a restaurant in your area very soon. Find out more and ask any questions you may have by calling Katie at 503-807-5715. 
It costs nothing to learn how you can protect your loved ones by planning ahead. Give Katie at Dignity Memorial a call today at 503-807-5715. Life is a journey and it really helps to have a roadmap, especially during your golden years of life. There are at least 80 senior living communities and 1,100 adult care homes in just the greater Portland, Vancouver metro area. At no cost to you or your family, you can plan now for the right fit for yourself or loved ones. Golden Placement Services is the roadmap to your new home. In four simple steps, assessment, research, touring, and follow-up, the Golden Girls will help you prepare for the next part of your journey. We found Golden Placement Services to be very helpful to us in locating a care facility for our father. They asked good questions to ascertain what kind of facility we were looking for. We were taken to a few homes that fit the criteria we were seeking, and we're very happy with the care our dad's receiving from the facility found for us by Golden Placements. Visit our website at goldenplacements.com to learn more. That's goldenplacements.com or call one of the Golden Girls at 503-723-7145 today. That's 503-723-7145 and schedule your non-obligation appointment today. We want to say a big thank you to our sponsors. They're the ones that uh, make this show possible. We are in studio with John Boylston, estate planning attorney with Myatt and Bell, local law firm. We're just getting uh, so much information here. Thank you so much, John, for coming in today. Yeah, and I just want to read the list again of our sponsors, uh, Dignity Memorial and Golden Placement Services, the two that you just heard uh, radio spots for. We also have 24-7 properties, 180-degree cash flow strategies, and Northwest Web Construction Company, and a special partnership with two of our favorite institutions here in Portland, Warner Pacific College and Multnomah University. So before we left for a break, we were talking about the power of attorney, and then maybe, John, you could kind of wrap up that part by helping us understand what happens if an event takes place, an incapacitating event or something, and I don't have a power of attorney uh, in place. What what happens? Absolutely. So if I were to be in a car accident, say, and I lose capacity, I'm in a coma or in the hospital, I'm no longer able to make financial decisions for myself, then somebody is going to have to step up and be able to pay my bills uh, and collect my social security benefits and things like that. And so if I don't, if I haven't named anybody as my power of attorney, then somebody will have to go to court on my behalf and seek a conservatorship from a judge. So that person will show up at the court. The court will send out a visitor to come interview me to whatever extent they're able to. They'll interview all my family members and anybody else close to me to determine whether or not uh, this is an appropriate person to be my conservator. And at the end of the day, the judge will grant them what's called letters of conservatorship. And that person then steps into my shoes for all legal purposes and can handle financial transactions on my behalf. But again, it's a long process, it's an expensive process, and often it's difficult for a family because you're fighting over who's, who's going to take care mm. of this incapacitated family member. So what happens uh, during the process? So if you're in the hospital and you're incapacitated um, and uh, a family member is requesting that conservatorship, what happens to your matters uh, in between that time? Mm. They're in limbo. Okay. If I've got auto pay set up on an account, it'll continue to pay out, Mm -hmm. even if I maybe don't need that service anymore. Uh, If I have bills that are coming due, they're not getting paid. Mm. And so you just end up in limbo until somebody steps in and gets approval from the court to take care of you. I have an ugly vision of chaos. We've got families Mm. fighting, family members fighting, and bills not getting paid, and bills accruing to pay people to sort out this mess. Yeah, it's not pretty. It is not pretty. <laughs> you know, John, you have a, a, a unique approach with this flat fee of uh, helping people overcome the obstacle of the cost, and the free consultation helps to do that as well. Um, and, and all of what you're telling us today indicates that overcoming the obstacles and getting in and doing this is, is incredibly important. Will you tell us how your... Um, flat fee operates? So when I sit down in a complimentary consultation with a family or a couple, I tell them we go over all their different estate planning options. We talk about all the tools we've talked about today. We talk about a will. We talk about a trust. We talk about exactly how that would work in their family and for their children and how they're going to be able to best take care of their kids. And then the family gets to decide which of those tools, which of those options do they want. 
and there's a it's an a la carte menu. So they pick the different options they want, and it, I get, tell them what the flat fee is for the various options they've selected. That's the agreement. They sign it. I sign it. And they, that's what they're going to pay. They pay half at the beginning and half at the end. And there's no questions. There's no surprises. There's no extra things added to the bill. It's just it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then they can spend as much time with me and I get to spend as much time with them as they need to feel comfortable with their plan and really feel good about what they're doing. Did you say on air, I know you've said it a couple times off air, about um, that you have a meeting with the, uh, with the adult children or with the kids of the uh, estate planning client? That is one of my favorite things to do, Dr. Yeah. Dan. I don't think we've talked about it yet today, but I love doing an estate plan for a couple and then sitting down around our conference room table in our office with their adult children and telling the children, this is what I did for your parents. This is why they did what they did. This is the decisions they've made, and here's the roles that each of you will be expected to take someday when your parents can't take care of themselves anymore. And here's how much you're each going to get from your parents someday. And that way, it gives the whole family a chance to talk about it. We believe in transparency and communication between families. And when you can have that sort of a discussion between generations in a family, it takes all the guesswork out of it. There's no surprises or hurt feelings someday down the road when the parents become incapacitated or pass away. And if the children aren't happy with the plan, I get to stand in for my clients and take the brunt. I get to be the bad guy and tell them that this is what I recommended and this is what I think makes the most sense for them. And they can be mad at me instead of their parent. But at the end of the day, we're able to have that intense family discussion, even if it's a fight. We get to have it now while the parents are still here and able to represent what they want and their wishes rather than later on down the road when they're no longer able to say what they want and it becomes a he said, she said between the kids. You know, when we parents don't talk about this stuff with their children, I find that the children often end up fighting later on when mm -hmm. the parents pass away. Sure. Right. And that's so, ugly. Yeah. So well said. And it's yeah. just so you the the whole picture that is painted here of what could happen versus what is the better could happen. <laughs> the option is, is very clear. There's so much chaos, so much relationship to be saved by doing this work in advance. Thank you so much for um, making those points so very clear today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to speak with you, Dr. Dan and Dr. Denise, today, and just so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. I can't let you go without this one last question. What is the most important thing that a boomer or a couple could do this week regarding estate planning? Review whatever estate plan you have. Take out those documents, and no matter how old they are or where you hid them, find them. <laughs> That's the first thing. Make sure you find them. And then review them, and make sure that they still represent your wishes and your honors. And if you don't understand them, find an attorney who can talk to you about them. Excellent. And if you don't have one, give John a call. Give exactly. his office a call and get over those obstacles and get it done. Absolutely. We'd be happy to talk with yeah. anyone. And you can contact John uh, through our website, secondhalfnow.com. There is a contact form. Uh, just put enough information in there so we know uh, what you're asking for and what you need. So we'll uh, forward that on to John. Thank you again, John Boylston, for coming in today. It's been very informative and very helpful. That's the program for today, folks. I want to encourage you to tune in every Monday, 5.30 to 6 p.m. for the on-air portion of Second Half Now. Then, of course, go to the website where you are now for that uh, part two. And that's available, of course, 24-7. New website is on the way. Talk to the web uh, developer today. We've got some new things coming. And uh, together, we are building a valuable resource for all of us. Second Half Now, a radio show for boomers and beyonders. Tools and tips, we say, for the life you want to live from now on. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Critchett, along with co-host Dr. Denise Hogan. Saying goodbye for now, and God bless you. And I pray that he will bless you with a life that honors him and blesses others. Let's meet again next Monday, 5.30 to 6 p.m. on the radio, KKPZ, 1330, The Truth. Thanks for listening to Second Half Now with Dr. Dan Critchett and Dr. Denise Hogan on KKPZ, 1330, The Truth. Sponsored by Dignity Memorial. To hear the rest of this program, find out more about the topics discussed today, or ask questions, visit secondhalfnow.com. That's secondhalfnow.com. Tune in next Monday at 5.30 p.m. for more tools and tips for the life you want to live from now on. Until then, visit secondhalfnow.com.